Hey everybody. I'm gonna give everybody just a second to hop on and then we will get started on our book. I'm gonna message a couple of people, make sure that they know that we're on here right now. Um, I can't tell who's on and who is not. So if you are on and you see a chat over on the right side, I'd love if you'd put your name so that I know exactly who is on our live stream and who is not. All right, I have a couple more people that are going to log on in just a second, and then we'll get started. Hopefully my dogs won't come and join me. Let's see. Just open up the link for a couple of people is what I'll do. Let's see. Sorry guys, I have somebody asking how to get on. I'm going to go ahead and get started. We have four people on here, so I'll just get started and then people can listen as they join in. So yesterday we read chapter two of Soon Be Free. And in yesterday's chapter, we did a, had a flashback to the year of 1857. So we were back in the past with the Weaver family. Now, if you'll remember from Still Away Home, their Ma and Rebecca had left and gone to Boston to um, visit with the family because Grandpa Baylor was had gotten sick. Okay, so um, they were gone, and so James and Pa are still at home by themselves, and suddenly somebody just was knocking on the door, and so James went to go check and see who it was, and it was Will Bowers, okay? And we know that Will left to fight in the war against the border ruffians. But when he returned, James noticed that something was different. Okay, so we have Will who's missing a leg. And obviously, James was not going to go fight because he's a Quaker. And that's just not what Quakers do. So instead, he stayed home and Will went to fight. Now, Will showed up and he did not want to go home because he was afraid of how his mom would react. So he's been bunking it with James now okay so hanging out and sleeping over at the Weaver so we're gonna go on to chapter three today and then we will go from there give me just a second I have one message let's see All right, let's go ahead and get started. So chapter three, Skeleton Key. So we're in the present with Dana and her family. I told the kids in the lunchroom on Monday, there was this really weird guy hanging around in my yard last night with a shovel and a flashlight. What did he want? Mike tilted his head back, and a sheet of straight black hair hung over his collar as he let a canned peach slice sli slither down the throat like a raw oyster. He has some amusing mannerisms. 
if you're into zoological feeding customs. That is so revolting. Sally wrinkled her freckled nose. What was the guy? A gas meter reader? Jeep popped the last of his sandwich into his mouth, and his words came out peanut butter garbled. On Sunday night? With a shovel and a flashlight? He said he was looking for his car keys. Oh yeah, I'd buy that, Jeep said. I held a spoonful of Swiss Miss tapioca in front of my lips. I know Mike hates tapioca because it reminds him of why he doesn't go to the dermatologist. How can you eat stuff that looks like zits? He asked. Like this? I slid the spoon into my mouth and slurred the pudding off. Delicious. The cafeteria werewolf came by and snapped up two of those vomit-colored trays. I smiled at her, which always makes the first end up on her arms. I said, whatever the guy was looking for out there, I'm sure it had to do with James. We gotta bring him into the picture again, Mike protested. The guy's been dead since before man started walking upright, and you women talk about him like he's a box office sensation. He flicked his tongue over his braces. There didn't seem to be enough room in his mouth for both his tongue and all that hardware. I know, I'm making him sound grotesque. He's actually kind of cute with those dimples that drill his cheeks when he laughs. And he laughs a lot. Sally, all business, said, Okay, guys, let's think this through. What's the working theory? None yet. I admitted. On, what do you think? On was eating Asian food she'd brought from home. Things that looked like stringy spinach and crunchy styrofoam strips. Unknown at this time. Wait and see if the creep turns up again, Jeep suggested. I loved the glow of his newly shaved brown head, oiled and glistening in the harsh cafeteria lights. Jeep is a young Michael Jordan. Only, it will probably be two years before he is eye-level with MJ's belt buckle. The noise in the cafeteria was becoming a thundering roar. Five minutes till we go down to the dungeon, Mike shouted over the chaos. The basement of Thorough Middle School is as indestructible as a Roman fortress. We have science down there just in case a chemical experiment explodes or one of the reptiles gets loose which is something we engineer pretty regularly. We're eighth graders. We are supposed to do stuff like that. The cafeteria was starting to clear out, and it sounded like a train rumbling through a subway station. I yelled, Did I mention I got the man's flashlight? Mike raised an eyebrow in interest. With his address on it, anyone want to go to Kansas City? How? Mike asked. We could hitchhike, Jeep said, tossing his fork and knife into a tub of soapy water. Splat. The cafeteria werewolf wiped her cheeks with her paws and scowled at Jeep. We were dying to catch her some night howling. We were dying to catch her some night howling at the full moon. Hitchhike and risk certain death, Sally reminded him. You afraid of a little old psychopathic truck driver, Sal? Mike asked. No, I'm afraid of my parents if they found out. Don't worry, we'll get a ride, I assured them all. Mike smashed the last of his peaches with his milk carton. We're infants. We're drivers licensely challenged, remember? You always see the glass half empty. I'm conceiving a plan, Mike, he groaned. A Dana plan. We're all doomed. That weekend, we had the grand opening of Firebird House, named that because it had risen from the ashes of one fire, plus both sackings of Lawrence. Now it was starting its fourth lifetime. Our own Firebird, a turquoise and yellow parakeet, watched with great boredom as we hung a rustic wooden placard on the wall next to his cage. Home of architect James Baylor Weaver, 
1906. End of Elizabeth Charles. Born in slavery around 1832 and laid to rest in this house in 1856. We peeked from behind the new pink window shears at the first customers pulled up in the car that seemed familiar. When Mom led them upstairs, I studied the register where Mr. and Miss Raymond Burke had scrawled their names on their Overland Park address and the license plate number of their car. It was the same old Ford that the man from Ernie's bait shop had driven. Now, I was more than curious. I had to find out what they were looking for, especially if it had something to do with James Weaver. The old-fashioned Victorian doors at Firebird House have the kind of keyholes big enough to see through, but that wouldn't have been enough to satisfy me. I had a skeleton key. All I had to do was wait for the Burks to get hungry. Okay. So clearly... Dana is interested in finding out just who these people are and why the man who was sneaking around her yard just checked into their bed and breakfast. So as we know, Dana doesn't do anything alone. She always takes her friend on with her or they do it as a whole friends group along with Mike and Jeep and Sally. So um, we're going to see this unfold, the mystery unfold of who these Burks, the family, the Burks are um, throughout the story. So. Let's see. I don't know. If you have any guesses as to who they are and why they're there, then I want you to shoot me a message on Go Guardian and let me know what your thoughts are. But for today, that's all.